Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Simon Rue. I'm the lead of the viral genomics group at JGI. And today I will present the Biosorter 2 software. So that means the vast majority of what I'm presenting is really led by Jaron Go here, who was the first author and the main slash only developer, really, of, of Biosorter 2. So basically, everything cool you see from now on is from Jaron. Um, Mike just said it, and I 100% I subscribe to this. Every tool is a bit different, every tool is a bit wrong. So, really, my goal here is, is to kind of tell you what makes Viosoto to a bit special, uh, what it could be useful for uh, in your research, and then what should you be careful with, basically, when trying to use Viosoto 2. Um, and I will start with a bit of history of where does Viosoto 2 comes from. Um, so, basically, to just like reframe, like we just said, um, every tool work a bit of the same way. We have known viruses, we have an input sequence. We're trying to guess if this input sequence is a virus or not. And you have two ways to do this. You can learn what a virus looks like from its gene content. So you start from your input sequence, you predict your gene or CDS, uh, and then you do an, a gene by gene annotation and you try to guess from this annotation whether or not your input is a virus. That's pretty much what was just described also with Vibrant and Synoty Taker. We do have alternatives. Um, that exist. Um, and mainly the idea will be to do the same thing, except uh, we try to, in this case, we'll try to identify or, you know, guess what a virus looks like purely based on the DNA sequence. So forget about genes, just from the raw DNA sequence, trying to find patterns that would uh, like be signature of viruses. And there are, again, many, many big different tools uh, that do both. Um, and just to reiterate, Vibrant, CNOT Taker, and Viosorter 2 will kind of fall into this former category, but I'm happy to talk about the latter in, in the panel session. Um, OK, so where does Viosorter comes from? Originally, we really um, worked and built from this Profinder tool, which was published in 28 by J.T. Lima Mendes, Jack Van Elden, Ariane Toussaint, and Raphael Leplay. And the idea at the time was to work from complete bacterial genomes and find these phage-like dense regions. And, and um, this group kind of developed a statistical framework to you know, robustly identify these regions of bacterial genomes that had more phage genes than um, the rest, or more phage genes than the background, basically. That's what we did and incorporated into VSOTO1. So you know, the reason why we developed VSOTO1 was to mine single cell amplified genomes, which were sort of the same kind of data, except more fragmented and more novel. So we use the same statistics on sliding windows, um, but we added more features. So instead of just looking for phage-like region, we also looked for uh, regions with like little to no gene annotation, because it's typically a signature of something uh, different from a regular bacteria, for instance. Uh, we also looked for enrichment in short genes, trend switches, et cetera, et cetera. And so in VSO1, one, one aspect we especially kind of um, focused on and, and found very interesting, and we also use it in, in Resorter 2, is this idea of, like Mike just described, anchoring your predictions on viral hallmark genes. And, and that's one of the illustrations I like. This is actually a, a real context that we had. So again, this is your input sequence. All the boxes are genes. In reds are genes with no annotation whatsoever. So you can already guess that this will not be statistically enriched in phase like genes, because it's basically, you know, it has no annotation. But among this, you know, island of um, we don't know what it is, you do find a capsid protein. And that's a typical signature of a very novel phage, right? Like no genes we can really tell anything about except a few key genes that are hallmark of viruses. So that's the kind of case that we are really trying to capture as much as possible in virus order. And then in virus order one, we also kind of inspired ourselves from Profinder and, and define like from the statistical framework, um, kind of three confidence categories. This was all pretty empirical and kind of based on our best judgment at the time. So not ideal, but for anyone who has used Biosoto 1, you are familiar with this idea of category one, two, and three from most to uh, least likely basic, uh, you know, prediction. Um, we added a few more things just to wrap up with Biosoto 1. Uh, we realized that the database were heavily skewed towards these head tail phages, these coloviruals. So we tried to do a separate database for non coloviruals and we also realized after the fact that we could apply this same you know the same approach to kind of clean viral metagenomes and remove my, uh, microbial contamination from there uh, but this required a few adjustments and so we had like again for people used to be sort of one we had this viral decontamination mode you could run but that was pretty much it for the sort of one uh, it was really good at finding even fragments of viruses that were distantly related to references it had this empirical threshold, which sometimes were too permissive, and I'm um, thinking especially of these category three sequences and predictions. 
And because it's all based on enrichment statistics and, and, and empirical thresholds, it was not really efficient on short context. And especially anything less than 10 KB and especially 5 KB was not really well called out by, by VS Auto 1. So that's where we started from VS Auto 2. We, we took VS Auto 1 and said, OK, how can we make it better and, and build from there? So again, just reiterating, Jarong really led all this effort. But basically, he, he re-implemented everything, trying to keep the same focus. So trying to maximize the breadth and diversity of virus detected. So trying to you know, tackle as many viruses as we can, still based on gene content with a big focus on hallmark genes and trying to have a tool that can handle any type of input, you know, from complete genomes to max to sax to metagenomes, virums and metatranscriptomes. The major changes, and I will kind of go into a little more details about this, but basically we transform this enrichment statistics and empirical thresholds into a random first classifier, which is akin to what um, you know, other tools like Vibrant do. We also removed all the fact that you had to you know, decide if you wanted to do the virum decontamination mode or not. Like we, we kind of unify all this. Um, this idea of having multiple databases was a good one in VR Auto 1, but we expanded it and this became five distinct classifiers and I will explain why. And then for people actually using the tool, we had a complete rewrite from Perl to Python 3, which makes it much improved, both in terms of performance and, and user experience. Okay, here is the mid of this and, and everything we sort of do basically is on this figure, which is your, your kind of schematic of how this uh, whole tool works. So you start from your input context. Like I said, we are gene content based tool. So we start from gene prediction, annotate the genes, this gives us a feature table per contig. Uh, we run this into our different classifiers, which tell us the likelihood of being a virus or not. And then from there, we are trying to either um, understand that the, whole, the full sequence is a virus, that's good, or if only part of the sequence is a virus and try to find the provirus or prophage bound, which uh, like Mike mentioned, is, is a difficult task. Um, for anyone like curious about the technical details, we are using really standard tool like uh, throughout all this pipeline, Prodigal 2, HMR3, Scikit-Learn for the random first classifier, nothing really fancy here, just like, you know, proven tools and, and, you know, tested and proven tools, basically. Okay, what makes VS Auto 2 special? Um, a few things starting from the database that we use for annotation. So we have a much expanded uh, database of HMM profiles based basically on two sources. One is this VPF, this viral protein families published in 2016, which had been designed from or built from isolates. And at the time, some viral context from metagenomes, again, 2016, so not the most updated data, but like it's a nice collection of HMMs for pretty much all viruses known at the time. And then we expanded it with what we call XFAM XC, which no, you know, was an earlier version of the EFAM database, which has now been, um, like I said, renamed EFAM and published uh, a few months ago. And this XFAM XC is a very large collection of highly curated HMM profiles from viral context extracted from metagenomes. Um, two major sources of data from this, the Global Ocean Virum data set and uh, the Stoddard and Meyer data set. So basically we are covering pretty well the ocean and soils. Um, and that kind of let us annotate way more genes than you would with a you know, standard, basically uh, HMM or gene database. So from there, we also, of course, new database, we had to you know, define which were the hallmark genes. Like Mike mentioned, we are not going crazy with it. We are mostly focusing on capsid machinery. And for some viruses, you can actually use a replication machinery as a hallmark. And I'm thinking especially of the RNA viruses, these RDRP genes are hallmark of viruses because only, only RNA viruses will need to replicate uh, RNA from an RNA template. But otherwise, we kind of work with experts in each of these different taxonomic groups to identify robustly which genes and which profiles were part of the capsid machinery and could be good hallmark genes. Now that's, you know, this was done. This give us a pretty expanded feature table. And um, on the right, you have the list of all the features that are fed to, you know, VSTR2 classifiers. I don't want to go throughout all of this. What I want to flag out though is uh, the features that are underlined were the one in VSTR1. So you can see how we expanded this to a much larger list. And finally, I already mentioned this a few times. Let's dig it a bit more into this, like I mentioned multiple classifiers. So the way we did this is we have one contig becomes one feature table, but then we actually divided the global viral diversity into five main groups and we um, trained five distinct random forest classifier to predict whether or not a contig will become, or you know, will be part of each of one of these groups. Um, we can debate if our you know, split is, is the best or not. Uh, I have actually like second thoughts of some of this, but basically we have a classifier for double-stranded DNA phages as a whole, giant viruses, 
RNA viruses, single strand DNA viruses, and we had viral phages on the side. This one, maybe we didn't learn, but like, you know, learn by, by doing, I guess. So the reason for doing this is, is kind of one of the central um, part of real software is that most likely you can't describe all viruses with a single model. And in fact, these different viruses will have different gene content and genome length and genome complexity and so on and so forth. And here is just like two examples. If you look at one of the features we use, which is how, you know, how many viral genes do you find and what is the percentage of viral genes you have in your input sequence? For non-viruses, it's very low, you know, of course. But for all these different groups, you can see how variable this can be. And so if you try to train a, a classifier on all of this, it's kind of difficult to, to consider everything at once. So we think that by splitting into a meaningful and small enough number of groups, we can actually help describing and, and eventually detecting a larger diversity of viruses. There is another example of a feature that we use, which is um, based on RBS predicted motif, which is very specific for giant viruses. You can see it's completely useless for all other viruses. It's, you know, all other viruses are exactly the same as non-viruses, but it's a very good feature for giant viruses. So that's kind of what we have tried to do is find all the features. We, we kind of compute them all, and then they will be weighted differently and used differently by different classifiers to hopefully maximize the detection. And one quick note that um, we also made it in a framework, and we here, I mean, again, Jarong <laughs> made a nice framework where if you are not happy with these five groups, you can design your own groups and train your own classifier to work within VS Auto 2. Okay, very quickly, some benchmarks. Uh, we try to evaluate in known and, and novel viruses. So we have known uh, tests with basically viruses from RefSeq, and then we use novel quote unquote viruses, which are not from RefSeq, and actually some of them were unpublished. So for the novel parts, none of this, uh, none of the tools we tested had quote unquote seen these viruses before. And then we actually also looked at, um, you know, fragmented assembly, of course. So going pretty quickly here, but basically ranging from short fragments to 20 KB fragments, um, this y-axis is the F1 measure. So you want to be higher. And these are your different tools with VS Auto 2 in blue. If you look at double stranded DNA phages in RefSeq, every tool is doing great, except at 1.5 KB, which is usual for gene content based tool. The um, chemo based tool in red and green here are doing a bit better. If you look at novel viruses and novel double stranded DNA phages, uh, the performance are, of course, kind of lowered, but VS Auto 2 does you know, pretty well. Um, Vibrant is also doing pretty well, and that's not surprising. We are using a pretty similar strategy. So eventually, both Vibrant and VSO2 are pretty good at detecting these novel phages, and phages more distantly related to references. If we switch to other viruses, though, the picture is a bit different. This is an example with NCLDV. And here, both in RefSeq and non-RefSeq, you can see how most tools don't perform well, which makes sense because they were not designed to detect uh, eukaryotic viruses in the first place. And again, that's uh, something that I think if, if, you are, if you have tools that are not designed to find specific groups of viruses from the get-go, it will be difficult for them to perform very well because these different groups of viruses are very different one from another. Um, so you can see here, VS Auto 2 is, is pretty good with NCLDV. There are some caveats with detecting gen viruses from metagenomes, and I'm happy to talk about this in, in the panel. So conclusion about VS Auto 2 specific features, we really focus on trying to detect viruses without close, uh, close relatives, ability to detect multiple types of viruses, and you know trying to be as efficient as possible even when you try when you go towards shorter contigs. And and Auto 2 is pretty good all the way up to three KB. And so if you're you know again uh, if this sounds good and this sounds useful to you, we have this. And again, thanks to Jiarong, we have Auto 2 on GitHub as a Bioconda package on Cyber. So there are plenty of way for you to kind of go. And, and try it out. Now, very quickly, two slides to finish about the blind spots and limitation, what you should be careful with when using real sorter too. Um, the number one is there are plenty of regions of microbial genomes that look like phages. I have listed a few here, you know, thalosins, type C secretion systems, all, all of this pretty much here are regions in a microbial genome that will look exactly like a phage in terms of gene content. So this will be false positive very often. Plasmids can also have phage-like replication machinery, which is a big issue because, again, it's 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 biology, but it you know it confuses the predictor basically. So what can you do about this? I would strongly recommend always post-processing your virus sequence prediction with a tool like CheckV, which is designed for this, which is designed for taking virus sequence prediction and trying to find which ones are wrong, basically. And it's doing a bit of a other thing, but like it can be used for this. And then beyond CheckV. 
um, we always recommend, and I always recommend, some amount of manual creation. And Jarong put together a very nice protocol on protocols.io that is, you know, a step-by-step -step description of how you can and probably should run VS Auto 2 and manually create your results to find this kind of cases, especially like Taylor scenes and type C secretion systems and so on and so forth. So that's kind of one big blind spot of, of I would argue, every tool, but I know for sure VS Auto 2. The other one that is more specific to VS Auto 2 is this idea of splitting into multiple classifiers. And, and you know, you could think, oh yeah, more classifier will be will be better. But it's not the case for VS Auto 2 because each one comes with its own error sources and error rates. For instance, gen virus classifier, uh, you know, gen viruses share genes with bacteria. And so if you feed in a lot of bacterial genomes, you will have a lot of false positive with this NCLDV classifier. So what we recommend is actually to tailor these classifiers and the one you select from the VS Auto 2 run to exactly what you want as output and what you know is in your input, basically. So if you are looking for standard phages and archaeal viruses, only use the Western DNA and single strand DNA classifiers will be our recommendation to avoid using extra classifiers, which will not bring anything good, but will only bring additional errors and mistakes, basically. And that's again something that is described by Jaron in the protocol. So conclusion: Visual 2 is one of these latest gene content virus detection tools. Detecting broad diversity of, of novel viruses is a big emphasis. We have this uh, uniquely created big database of metagenome derived profiles. And again, a unique part is this idea of splitting the virus um, global viral diversity into different groups to better detect each one of them. Um, plenty of remaining challenges questions. Hopefully some of this will be touched upon uh, during the panel, but AMGs, uh, meaning host derived genes in virus genomes is a big uh, complicated topic. Giant viruses still challenging, plasmids very challenging. And then we already had like some of these questions in the Q&A, so I'm more than happy to talk about like this idea of gene content versus gamer tools. And also, should you use like 20 different tools? And if you do so, how do you aggregate the results? And with that, I think I'm right on time to thank everyone involved in, uh, you know, from the beginning of VSOTO 1 to this very new iteration of VSOTO 2.